Closures are self-containing blocks of functionality that can be passed around and used in your code. Closures in Swift are similar to blocks in C and Objective-C and to Lambdas and other programming languages. Closures can capture and store references to any constants and variables from the context in which they are defined. This is known as closing over constants and variables. Swift handles all of the memory management of capturing for you. Capturing will be explained below. <clears throat> Global and nested functions, as introduced in functions, are actually special cases of closures. Closures take one of three forms. Global functions are closures that have a name and do not capture any values. Nested functions are closures that have a name and can capture values from their enclosing function. Closer expressions are unnamed closures written in lightweight syntax that can capture values from their surrounding context. Swift's closures have a clean, clear style with optimizations that encourage brief clutter-free syntax in common scenarios. These optimizations include inferring parameter and return value types from context, implicit returns from single expression closures, shorthand argument names, and trailing closure syntax. Closure expressions. Nested functions as introduced in nested functions are a convenient means of naming and defining self-contained blocks of code as part of a larger function. However, it's sometimes useful to write shorter versions of function like constructs without a full declaration and name. This is particularly true when you work with functions or methods that take functions or as one or more of their arguments. Closure, closure expressions are a way to write inline closures in a brief focus syntax. Closure expressions provide several syntax optimizations for writing closures in shortened form without loss of clarity or intent. The closure expression examples below illustrate these optimizations by refining a single example of the sorted by method over several iterations, each of which expresses the same functionality in a more succinct way. The sorted method. Let names equal Chris, Alex, Iwa, Barry, Daniela. The sorted by method will accept a closure that takes two arguments of the same type as the array's content and return a bool to say whether the first value should appear before or after the second value. The sorting closure needs to return true if the first value should appear before and false otherwise. So the example here takes has the sorting closure which will take two strings and return the bool and func backward takes these two strings and returns a bool, s1 greater than s2, var reverse names equals names.sorted, which takes the closure backward as an argument. So it's basically just a function which is passed in as an argument. The first string is greater than the second string and backward function will return true. And this gives a reverse alphabetical store with Barry being placed before Alex and so on. However, this is a rather long-winded way to write that, what is essentially a single expression function, A greater than B. In this example, it would be preferable to write the sorting closure inline without the sorting closure expression syntax. So in general, it's basically parameters, return type in and then a bunch of statements. So the example here becomes reverse names equals names.sorted by, and then we have our closure, uh, s1, s2 strings, go to bool in, return s1 greater than s2. Note the declaration of parameters and return type for this inline closure is identical to the declaration from the backward function. In both cases, it's written as s1 string s2 string goes to bool. However, for inline closure expression, the parameters and return type are written inside the curly braces, not outside of them. So when we write a function, we wrote the parameters and the return outside the braces. And when we're writing the inline closure, we're going to write them inside the braces and then just say in and then 
the function, the return. The start of the closures body is introduced by the in keyword. This keyword indicates that the definition of the closures parameters and return type has finished and the body has begun. Because the body of the closure is so short, it can even be written on a single line. This illustrates that the overall call, call to sorted by method has remained the same and a pair of parentheses still wrap the entire argument for the method. However, the argument is now an inline closure. Inferring type from context. Because the sorting closure is passed as an argument to a method, Swift can infer the types of parameters and the type of value it returns. And so we don't need to specify the types here. And we can just do reverse names equals names.sorted by s1, s2 in return s1 greater than s2. So s1, s2 are our string parameters and we use the in keyword to separate the body out and then the body is simply to return s1 greater than s2. All of this goes inside the curly braces is part of this by argument and all of that goes inside the parentheses because that's parameters for the sorted function. Now it's always possible to infer the parameter types and return type when passing a closure and so as a result you never need to write an inline closure in its fullest form when the closure is used as a function or method argument. Nonetheless you can still make it explicit if you wish. Okay. Now implicit returns from single expression closures. So the last line is return, so we don't even need to write the keyword return here. And we can simply say s1, s2 in s1 greater than s2. All right. And that will return the Boolean value that we're looking for for this closure. And the sorted function can act with it. Now, shorthand argument names. Swift automatically provides shorthand argument names to inline closures, which can be used to refer to the values of the closures argument by the names $0, $1, $2, and so on. If you use these shorthand argument names within your closure expression, you can omit the closures argument list from the definition and the number and type of the shorthand argument names will be inferred from the expected function type. The in keyword can also be omitted in this case because the closure expression is made up entirely of the body and no parameters are needed here. So $0, $1 refer to the closures first and second string arguments here. Now operator methods. There's actually an even shorter way to do this, and it's to just write by colon greater than operator. And that means that we're going to have two parameters and we're comparing them using the greater than sign. So Swift will infer that you want to use its string specific implementation and you can match the sorted by. Okay, so that's an operator method. Now, trailing closures. If you need to pass a closure expression to a function as the function's final argument and the closure expression is long, it can be useful to write it as a trailing closure instead. A trailing closure is written after the function calls parentheses, even though it's still an argument to the function. When you use the trailing closure syntax, you don't write the argument label for the closure as part of the function call. So we can do func, some function that takes a closure, pass in the closure, just the parentheses, and we will return the void and then put the function body there. Okay. Here's how you call this function without using a trailing closure. 
some function that takes a closure, closure colon, and then the closure body goes there. Here's how you call the function with a trailing closure instead, some function that takes a closure, and then the trailing closure body goes here. Okay, and the strings sorting closure from the closure expression syntax section above can be written outside of the sorted by method parentheses as a trailing closure. So we can do reverse names equals names dot sorted, and then pass in the trailing closure as dollar zero greater than dollar one. If a closure expression is provided as the function or methods only argument, and you provide that expression as a trailing closure, you do not need to write a pair of parentheses after the function or methods name when you call the function. So you can do reverse names equals names dot sorted. And then in braces, just do dollar zero greater than dollar one. So if you're doing trailing closures, you can even skip the two parentheses if you like. Now trailing closures are most useful when the closure is sufficiently long that it's not possible to write it in line on a single line. As an example, Swift's array has a map underscore colon method which takes a closure expression as its single argument. The closure is called once for each item in the array and returns an alternative mapped value for that item. The nature of the mapping and the type of the return value is left up to the closure to specify. So after applying the provided closure to each array element, the map method returns a new array containing all of the new mapped values in the same order as their corresponding value in the original array. Here's how you can use the map method when with a trailing closure to convert an array of int values into an array of string values. So we'll take 16, 58, 5, 10 and create 1, 6, 5, 8 and 5, 1, 0. So let the digit names be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 as a key value array and let the numbers be 16, 58, and 510. And so we can now define let strings equals numbers dot map, uh, and then a trailing closure, which will take a number and give a string, those are the arguments, in, and then the logic will be var number equal number, var output equal blank, and repeat output equal digit names number mod 10, uh, unwrap that plus output number divided by 10 and then while number is greater than 0 return the output and so strings is inferred to be type string its value is 1658510 okay so now the map method calls the closure expression once for each item in the array and you do not need to specify the type of closure's input parameter number because the type can be inferred from the values in the array to be mapped in this example. The variable number is initialized with the value of the closure's number parameter so that the values can be modified within the closure body the parameters to functions and closures are always constants. The closure expression also specifies a return type of string to indicate the type that will be stored in the mapped output array. The closure expression builds a string called output each time it's called. It calculates the last digit of number by using the remainder operator and uses this digit to look up an appropriate string in the digit names dictionary, the closure can be used to create a string representation of any integer greater than zero. All right, that was an explanation of all the code that we just read. Okay, note the exclamation mark is used because the dictionary subscripts return optional values and we want to convert them to their actual values, so basically the unwrapping of an optional. If you don't understand optional, see my lecture on optional. Now, the string retrieved from the digit names dictionary is added to the front of the output, effectively building a string version of the number in reverse. The expression number percent 10 gives a value of 6 for 16, 8 for 58, and 0 for 510. 
that's what a mod operator does uh, number of variables divided process so we're just explaining that function that we just read uh, let's move on to capturing values a closure can capture constants and variables from the surrounding context in which it's defined. The closure can then refer to and modify these values of those constants and variables from within its body, even if the original scope that defined the constants and variables no longer exists. And in Swift, the simplest form of a closure that can capture values is a nested function written within the body of another function. A nested function can capture any of its outer functions, arguments, and can also capture any constants and variables defined within the outer function. Here's an example of a function called makeIncrementer, which contains a nested function called incrementer. Alright, well let's take a look here. So makeIncrementer takes an argument for increment amount. colon int goes to parentheses goes to int and then we have this uh, closure var running total equals zero fun incrementer int running total plus amount run it return running total return the incrementer so it's just a nested function uh, incrementer takes two values running total and amount and uses them so all we're saying here is that this running here's the function incrementer which is nested inside this running total and amount are grabbed from the parameters or from within the function here okay uh, the return types are int here and Yeah, just verbose. All right, func incrementer goes to it, running total. Just explained it. The incrementer function doesn't have any parameters, and yet it refers to running total amount from within the body. Uh, that's how closures work. Basically, they're getting this environment uh, from the parent, uh, from the surrounding body. Capturing by reference ensures that running total and amount do not disappear when the call to make incrementer ends, and also ensures that the running total is available for the next time the incrementer function is called. Okay, memory management's all handled, so you don't need to do anything. <clears throat> Let increment by 10 be make incrementer for increment colon 10. And now you have an increment by 10, you can use it, you can keep calling it, and it will keep incrementing by 10. Using the runner running total and the amount. And if you create a second incrementer, it will have its own reference. So you can create increment by 7, make incrementer for increment by 7. And if you use the original one, you'll still get the 40. Because it preserves its environment and state. So closures are basically a way to preserve state and multiple uh, states can be kept for each instance of the closure. So the instance will preserve the state. And in the example above, increment by 7 and increment by 10 are constants, but the closures these constants refer to are still able to increment the running total variables that they have captured and that's what capturing is is basically that instance has captured the particular state so and that's because they are reference types so it's just referring to different memory locations and whenever you assign a function or closure to a constant or variable you are actually setting that constant or variable to be a reference to the function or closure in that example it's the choice of closure that increment by 10 refers to that this constant and not to the constant contents of the closure itself and that also means you assign a closure to two different constants or variables both of those constants or variables will refer to the same closure so if you do let also increment by 10 increment by 10 also increment by 10 that will return a value of 50 because it will refer to the same location. 
Now, escaping closures. A closure is said to escape a function when the closure is passed as an argument to the function, but is called after the function returns. So when you declare a function that takes a closure as a parameter, you can write at escaping before the parameters type to indicate that the closure is allowed to escape. So one way a closure can escape is by store, being stored in a variable that is defined outside the function. As an example, many functions that start as a asynchronous operation take a closure argument as a completion handler, and the function returns after it starts the operation, but the closure isn't called until the operation is completed, and the closure needs to escape to be called later, for example, bar completion handlers. And then we're going to take and return void, and that's an array, and then func sum completion function with escaping closure. Completion handler add escaping goes to void, and completion handler, so our pen completion handler. So we have a com escaping closure. And now the sum function with escaping closure function takes a closure as its argument and adds it to an array that's declared outside the function. If you didn't mark the parameter of this function without escaping, you would get a compile time error. But because we did, we can use it outside the function. Now making a closure without escaping means that you have to refer to self explicitly with the closure. For example, in the code below, the closure pass to some function with escaping closure is an escaping closure, which means it needs to refer to self explicitly. In contrast, the closure passed to some function with non-escaping closure is a non-escaping closure, which means it can refer to self implicitly. func some function with non-escaping closure, closure colon, parentheses, arrow void, closure sum, class var x equals 10, func do something, call some function with an escape enclosure. You have to use the self keyword, self.x equals 100. Some function with non-escape enclosure, you can just say x equals 200. Let instance equal some class, instance of do something. Print instance.x prints 200. Completion handler stop first. And print instance.x prints 100. Autoclosures. An autoclosure is a closure that automatically created to wrap an expression that's being passed as an argument to a function. It doesn't take any arguments, and when it's called, it returns a value of the expression that's wrapped inside it. This syntactic convenience lets you omit braces around a function's parameter by writing a normal expression instead of an explicit closure. It's common to call functions that take auto closures, but it's not common to implement that kind of function. For example, the assert condition colon message colon file colon line function takes an auto closure for its condition and message parameters. Its condition parameter is evaluated only in debug builds, and its message parameter is evaluated only if the if condition is false. And auto closure lets you delay evaluation because the code inside it isn't run until you can call the closure. Delaying evaluation is useful for code that has side effects or is computationally expensive because it lets you control when that code is evaluated. The code below shows how a closure delays evaluation. So we have customers in line. Uh, it's an array. We can print the count that's five the cu let customer provider be a customers in line dot remove at zero and then print customers in line dot count so we print five and then now serving customer provider so that prints now serving Chris and then print customers in line dot count and that prints four okay
And even though the first element of the customer line array is removed by the code inside the closure, the array element isn't removed until the closure is actually called. If the closure is never called, the expression would never be evaluated, which means the array element is never removed. Note that the type of customer provider is not string, but print arrow goes to string, which is a function with no parameters that returns a string. So note that the type is not a string, but a function. And you can get the same behavior of delayed evaluation when you pass a closure as an argument to a function. So func serve takes customer, customer provider, colon, which gives a string. And then uh, serve is, and then we'll call serve uh, with a customer. Customers in line remove at zero, which is a closure. And to that function in the listing takes an explicit closure that returns a customer's name and the version of serve customer colon below performs the same operation but instead of taking an explicit closure takes an auto closure by making its parameter type with the at auto closure attribute and now you can call the function as if it took a string argument instead of a closure the argument is automatically converted to a closure because the customer provider parameters type is being marked as auto closure attribute so we'll mark the function as an auto closure and so we don't need to put closure here we can just do customers in line dot remove at zero okay so overusing auto closures can make your code hard to understand so the context and function name should make it clear that evaluation is being deferred if you want an auto closure that's allowed to escape use both the at auto closure and at escape attributes the at escaping attribute is described above in escaping closures <clears throat> bar customer providers uh, taken a array of functions uh, which return strings and function func collect customer providers takes a customer provider at auto closure at escaping so we're using both in this case at clo auto closure and at escaping passing in this function which returns a string and customer providers dot append customer provider so we're creating a collection of customer providers here customers in line remove at zero uh, print and now serving customer provider so we can say now serving Barry now serving Daniela and in the code above instead of calling the closure pass to it as a customer provider argument the collect customer providers function appends the closure to the customer providers array. The array is declared outside the scope of the function, which means that the closures in the array can be executed after the function returns. As a result, the value of customer provider argument must be allowed to escape the function's scope. Uh, that's what add escaping does, as we talked about earlier. And that's it for closures in Swift 4.